Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nathan Porter, and I'm a fellow of Creature Kind and a student at Duke Divinity School. Now, on behalf of Duke and Creature Kind, I'd like to welcome you to the first dialogue in our series, Christianity in an Age of Factory Farming. Today, we're honored to have joining us Professors Jeremy Begby and Richard Bauckham, who will be discussing Christology and its implications for the Christian understanding of industrialized agriculture. Professor Begbie is the Thomas A. Langford Distinguished Professor of Theology at Duke Divinity School, the Director of Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts, and a senior member of Wolfson College at the University of Cambridge. He's the author, the author or editor of 11 books, including Voicing Creation's Praise and Redeeming Transcendence, and is an accomplished musician and internationally recognized speaker. Professor Bauckham is Professor Emeritus at the University of St. Andrews and a senior scholar at Ridley Hall, University of Cambridge. He's the author or editor of over 40 books, and although he's most widely known as a New Testament scholar, Professor Bauckham has also published two volumes on animals and ecological readings of scripture, entitled Living with Other Creatures and the Bible and Ecology. Today's conversation will be led by Professor Begbie, who will interview Professor Bauckham about his understanding of the relation between Christology and animals, and we'll have time afterwards for Q&A. Now, I'd ask that you hold your questions until the professors have finished their discussion, and then that you would enter them uh, in the question and answer box in the comments, or, uh, sorry, in the question and answer box at the bottom of the Zoom window. I'm still getting used to this setup here. Now, uh, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Professor Begbie and Professor Bauckham. Professor Begbie, take it away. Thank you so much, Nathan, for that lovely warm introduction. And thank you for putting this topic so clearly on the map um, and for your keenness to do that in a theological way. That, that is very, very important, these days, it seems to me. And I should say, greetings from Cambridge. Rich and I are both at Cambridge, although we're a couple of miles apart um, right at present. We are both members of the same Bible study group in our church, so we've come to know each other quite well, and of course for many years I've enjoyed Richard's uh, extraordinary series of books on this and related topics. Richard, we've been asked to explore the implications of the incarnation in particular for a Christian approach to animal welfare, uh, for God coming as one of us, as human. So let's dive into one of the classic texts on the Incarnation, perhaps the classic text from the prologue of the Gospel of John. I thought this would be a good place to start. And the word was made flesh. Uh, what is this flesh, do you think, that the divine word has become? And what might have it to do with animals? Um, yes, it's a good question, good place to start, I think. I, I mean, perfect, but actually, to start with, I think it's probably worth remembering that the word we've been told that the word, it was through the word that all things were created. So the, the word who became flesh was God the creator, um, the divine son, the divine word who became flesh. And flesh, flesh obviously, I, I mean, it, it means that Jesus became a uh, fully human being, but it does place the emphasis, I think, on the, on, on the bodiliness of, of, mm. of, of human being and perhaps on its mortality and weakness. Um, but of course, flesh is not a word that the Bible applies only just to humans. It, it applies the word flesh to all animals. And so being flesh, for us being flesh is, as it were, our solidarity with the other, the rest of the animal creation. Um, and Jesus in the incarnation enters that human solidarity uh, with, with, with all the creatures that he, have, he has created, but he, he, he enters into a different relationship with them. Uh, not only as creator, but also as as fellow creature, as, as we are. So this is the creator, no less, uh, coming to identify not simply with humans, but with all creatures and all creatureliness. Um, do, is there any connotation of sinfulness in flesh in this in this text? I I, I don't think so. I, I mean, it tends to have that nuance when Paul uses the word, but I think mm. when John uses the word, it, it, it tends to tends to have the, the aspect of, of weakness and, and mortality. Yeah. Um, uh, um, John opposes it to spirit, which is eternal life, you know, uh, whereas flesh only has mortal life. So it's a kind of, but of course, what one can say again about uh, uh, Jesus is that um, he became 
uh, a fellow creature with all of us um, in incarnation and, and through bodily resurrection, he, he retains that, uh, that solidarity with all creatures. So his fleshly humanity is not shed like a skin. It's actually taken into the very presence of God, exalted into the presence of God, which is another mark of its value, presumably, and, and God's valuing of all created things. Um, the, the text goes on, one to speak of full of grace and truth. Um, I seem to remember that, uh, you saying that, that one of the things this indicates is, is that um, here we are dealing with the very character of God. And uh, say more about that in relation to attitudes to creation and, and animals in particular. Well, I think that phrase full of grace and truth is an echo of that um, famous in the Old Testament uh, characterization of God. You know, God revealed himself to Moses as merciful and gracious, slow to anger, full of grace, uh, full of um, full of loving kindness, abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness. Um, so I think John is saying that the character of God is embodied in Jesus' human life, um, which of course means it can also be embodied in, in our human lives, embodied perfectly in Jesus' human life, imperfectly in us, but, um, but embodied all the same. Mm. And I think one of the things that does is really important is to take us back to the Old Testament. We cannot really understand the incarnation mm. without thinking about the God of the Old Testament, to, which is where John's Gospel starts, as it were, um, and thinking about what, what does what is the character of God? What is God being abounding in steadfast love, merciful, gracious? What does that mean for God's relationship to, to the world? And uh, when you first come across that in, in the Old Testament, it sounds a bit like it's God's relationship to Israel, but it's very clear as the Old Testament uh, moves on um, that um, the, the, the Old Testament writers saw that if God was like that in relation to Israel, he can't he can't be like that only in relation yeah. to Israel. It becomes how God is in relation to all his creatures and uh, not just humans, but all creatures. I, I think in the wonderful, uh, wonderful Psalm 145, which is about the character of God and the kingdom of God. Um, uh, it, it says that God is good to all and has compassion Passion, on yeah. all that he has made all creatures and if you doubt if that means all animals um he goes on later in the psalm to, to speak of humans and animals um and of course it's the you get it several times in the old testament the image of god caring yeah. uh, for the animal creation yeah, yeah. providing the birds with their food uh, which jesus takes up that phrase of course um so uh, i think there we, we we can relate jesus christ in the incarnation to the God who cares, lovingly cares for his whole creation. We must, we must explore that later, the care and compassion um, duo, definitely. Uh, a great deal depends, it starts to me, on, this, on the debate around animals, and particularly from a Christian point of view, on how we conceive human uniqueness, and particularly how therefore we understand specifically the intended relationship between humans and the rest of the animal kingdom. And so I wonder if we might just sort of scan a little bit more widely um, how you understand humans, <laughs> you know, small topic, humans place in the created order as a whole, and how we might wrestle free from certain oppressive or very exploitative models of, of humanity's place in the scheme of things. Um, we can't avoid the phrase image of God. Tell us, tell us the truth about the image of God, Richard. Um, that, that, that takes us, uh, it takes us, I think, uh, back to what I just said about human life, you know, the character of God can be embodied in human life. We can be like God. Um, you know, Jesus says in, in Luke's Gospel, be merciful as your heavenly Father is, is merciful. So the moral characteristics of God are, I think, in the Bible, the most important ways in which humans resemble God. Um, and that does take us back, of course, to Genesis 1, uh, where we're told that humans are made in the image of God. Um, and of course, it goes on to say that humans are given dominion, 
yeah. that's, the, that's the other word, isn't it? Yeah, over over other living creatures. Um, doesn't actually that's... say over the earth as a whole, does it? At that point, no, in, indeed, it doesn't. Uh, people tend to exaggerate uh, the meaning there. It's very specifically over other living creatures. So the you know all the living creatures have been described in Genesis one, you know, including the birds and the fish and, and all sorts of things. Um, I think, you know, if, if you think again of dominion as an exercise, you see, I, th I think the image of God in a way is what qualifies us to be able to exercise dominion. I don't think the image of God is limited to that. You know, we shouldn't tie it so closely to dominion that that's all it means. There are um, some who have said that, haven't they, that image of God yeah. consists in. Uh, and I think I really think that's wrong. Uh, and it's no. really quite misleading because it, it well, for one thing, it just narrows the meaning of the image of God, yeah. you know, so much. And um, uh, so, so uh, you know, we reflect, we, we we surely reflect God in our dealings with with other people as well as with other right. living things and and, and so on. Um, but I think insofar as dominion is concerned, I mean, I like the like the term responsible care. Yeah. You know, yeah. various yeah. kind of words that people have tried to expound, expound that in, you know, to avoid the misunderstanding of domination and so on. <laughs> Stewardship is very popular. I, I like responsible care um, because if, uh, if we are to exercise dominion um, uh, over the other living creatures, I mean, it is a royal image. And so we can look at what, what does the ideal king in the <laughs> Old Testament do? And he cares for his subjects, yeah. you know. Um, responsible care is really the, the what, what human kingship means, and of course it's what God's kingship means. So I, I think that's the, 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 the sense, and, and it, you see it's partly because we reflect, we can reflect the love um, and care of God for his creation, that we can exercise the dominion. Um, yeah. I would also say, I mean, if you think about it, this is not directly from the text of scripture, but you think about it, I mean, um, we are the only animals that can actually see the world as a whole. I mean, we're really the only animals that realize that, you know, the, the climate change crisis in the whole world, you know, and we're, we're actually the only animals who have that kind of knowledge mm. um, because we can step outside our own immediate um, context. Yeah. Most animals live in a quite uh, quite defined context. Um, we, because of the sort of intelligence we've got and the skills that we, we've developed, um, we can actually see what's going on in the whole world and take responsibility for it. Um, you, you can't expect a whale to take responsibility for, for, for the creation. Um, but, but, so but, the, res the responsible bit then is about responsible before God, not just responsive or yeah. responsible yes. to the creature. No, yes, yes, yes. Indeed. And, and yes. you wouldn't be. Uh, that... I want to... Sorry, just one more. Of course, no, no, absolutely. Yeah, a bit, a bit about... it's so important about the creation narrative because that, that of course comes towards the end of the creation narrative when humans are created. Um, but so often people have read the creation narrative as meaning that the rest of creation is there for us. No. Um, you know, that it's, it's so anthropocentric, it's all leading up to us. Um, and one thing to say about that is actually it's all leading up to God because uh, humans are the last thing to be created, but then we have the, the, the God's, God's rest on the seventh day. Right. Um, but also, you know, um, the, the, ref the refrain in, in, the, in the creation narrative. Um, it, each time God creates something, it says, and he saw that it was good. And he says that every time, you know, so it, each thing has its own value in God's sight. It doesn't yeah. have to wait uh, till we come on the scene. Yeah. Um, and there's also, I think, a strong sense of interdependence um, between all the various creatures. And when you start thinking about it, one reason we come at the end of the list is because we are actually dependent on all the other creation, yep. all the other features of creation. I mean, one thing about being human is that we're actually more dependent on all the other creatures than any of them are. Mm. Um, so uh, I like to talk about community of creation, which God has created, you know, and Communities have different roles, different people within the community serve the whole community in different ways. And our 
caring responsibility, you know, is our special role within the community of creation. But what that means is that we are, first of all, fellow creatures with other creatures. And then we also have the special role of responsible care. Responsible care. So I, I think we need, to, we need to set ourselves within creation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, the thing that's really gone wrong, I think, in, in, in the modern period um, is the kind of thinking about humans as being over and above creation, uh, mm -hmm. almost as though we are the creators. Um, uh, and certainly that we have sort of sovereign control over it all. Um, but I think the Bible puts us very squarely in the first place among the creatures. And we can only exercise this caring responsibility of properly if we actually remember that we are fellow creatures with these yeah. other creatures. And presumably it's very easy to imagine our dominion as if that were about uh, stepping apart from space and time uh, rather than being uh, fi finite and creaturely in the, mm -hmm. in the fullest mm -hmm. sense. And also, if we just about lordship a second, presumably that is another category that would have to be re reformed around the kind of care and compassion that you're talking about. Is that right? Around, in other words, it has to be modeled according to the lordship of Christ, which is not one of subjugation as such, uh, or centrally. Is that is that right? Yes, I think so. You know, I mean, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Um, it's a very general statement. Of course, in context, one thinks immediately of other humans, but he, he came to serve the whole creation. Yeah. Yep, indeed. By the way, we were chatting yesterday, and uh, you mentioned that Bo you thought Boris Johnson, when he came to power in, in 2019, uh, said something about the welfare of animals. I actually looked it up, and there in his manifesto in front of Dan, Dan Downing Street, he said, quote, and let's promote the welfare of animals, something that has been always close to the hearts of the British people. How about that? It's good to be <laughs> British, but maybe Biden will say something similar when he... Um, when he takes the reins in January. Maybe it's worth just noting that, that the reason I brought that up was because, you know, I mean, Boris rather tends to have big ideas and never carries them through, but there actually is now a, a proposed law that's going to go through yeah, um, indeed. specifically to forbid the transport of uh, livestock outside the country. So, you know, for the long, long journeys into southern Europe and all that sort of stuff, which are terrible for 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 you know, animals that are shipped, shipped abroad just to be eaten. Um, very cool. Um, so, you know, that's actually going to, going to take effect, which is uh, uh, something a bit vaguer about, you know, they hope to change the regulations about transport of animals within this country. Uh, so, you, you know, that sort of, uh, people don't always stick to their manifestos, but it does look like that one is going to, is going yeah. to get some. Yeah, that's great. In the Gospels, um, as far as Jesus is concerned, are, is there evidence that he would have shared this, this attitude of, as you put it, care and compassion for animals? Well, well, the one, I mean, of course, animals are not mentioned very much in the Gospels. I, I do like Mark's version of the temptation of Jesus, you know, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, before he sets out on his ministry. Um, he, he goes out into the desert, and Mark doesn't tell us, you know, the story of the temptations as Luke and Matthew do. But Mark tells us that he was with the wild animals. Mm. And it, I think it's a lovely phrase. I, I think it evokes um, the picture in Isaiah 11 of peace between humans yeah. and, and, and animals. Um, and, and Jesus doesn't, doesn't um, command them or uh, he certainly doesn't eat them or, you know, he doesn't, doesn't do anything dominating yeah, yeah. at all. He's just with them. Um, ju just as later on, he's with the disciples. It's, it's a lovely... It's lovely. And it's got, that, that, like Isaiah 11, it's got the kind of eschatological tinge, presumably. I mean, this yeah, is, a, yeah, this is yeah. a picture of, of the way things work. And if yeah. I remember, Satan comes just before, and the angels come just after, right? And the That's wild right. animals are in the middle. Yeah, it's extraordinary. So I think Jesus as the Messiah is sorting out, to begin with, his relationships to the non-human creation. Yeah. Um, and that includes the devil, who, who he um, uh, resists. Um, and it includes the angels who uh, minister to him. And, you know, the angels are friends, the devil is enemy. The animals are in between. They're, they're, yeah. they, you can make them an enemy, yeah, but yeah. you can also make them friends. Uh, and I think that's what Jesus does. That's terrific. Do you think the um, image of shepherd has anything to tell us about animals, or is that just going to read too much in, into things? Well, you know, I mean, it was a favourite image 
Uh, it was a favourite image of kings in, in the ancient world. Um, and of course, it's applied to God in famous passages in the Old Testament, especially Psalm 23 that everyone knows. And Jesus takes it up in you know, a couple of parables about, about the good shepherd. And yeah. it's quite clear that the, the, the reason you could, uh, as it were, compare God or Jesus with a good shepherd is because a good shepherd's job was to be caring yeah. um, for his animals. Um, and, you, you know, there, there were also uh, denunciations of the bad shepherds who neglect their animals, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the, 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 the wicked rulers of Israel, the bad shepherd, but the good shepherd, which makes it possible to make that comparison with God, mm. um, is, is, is a, um, someone who's, uh, and you could actually read Psalm 23, or a good chunk of Psalm 23. Obviously, we read it uh, as we're meant to, uh, as about the relationship of God, God's taking care of us. You could, as it were, translate it back. And what does it mean about the shepherd yep. taking mm -hmm. care of his sheep? Um, and it's perhaps, it's one of those places in, in the Old Testament, where, uh, again, in the New, where you get a, um, a you know, in, in John 10, where Jesus tells the parable of the good shepherd, he says that the shepherd calls all his sheep by name. Yes, it's wonderful. Uh, yeah. It's rather extraordinary. Uh, you know, when I see sheep, I can't really tell one from another. Um, yeah. But, you know, a shepherd, because shepherds in nature world lived with their sheep you know, so inten intensively, they, they probably did give them names. Yeah, no, um, but showed a sense of care and concern and, you know, yeah, treating like I don't yeah. know about modern sheep. I worked in a dairy farm once and uh, uh, a herd of 120 uh, cattle. And uh, the, the, the farmer, he knew the name. He, he had a name for every single one. I knew its moods and what it liked, didn't like, and all the thread extremely well. It's care. Never... I think, I think that, and that kind of traditional farming um, that, the, you know, came in, in, the, in the West before modern sort of factory farming. I yeah. mean, it was so different because farmers had that kind of relationship with their animals yeah. um, and they couldn't actually treat their animals as, as mere objects you know because because they knew them you know it's like when people have a dog they they, they realize it, it's, a, it's a kind of a subject of its own life absolutely uh, farmers weren't sentimental about that of course they had to kill their livestock and stuff but but they did recognize the the sort of subjecthood of, of these animals because they they knew them they weren't just sort of all stuffed in a huge factory in their hundreds and thousands. So I'm glad you've got onto that because I was bringing this right down to earth now. When industrialized agriculture, factory farming, um, you presumably have many questions to ask about all that in the light of what you've just said. I, I, I mean, I think factory farming is, is iniquitous. I, I, I really do. And, and um, I, I think that, for example, I mean, Christians should regard it as a, as a Christian duty only to eat uh, free range eggs. Mm. Um, when you see, and it's uh, actually public opinion, you know, the thing, thing is, of course, it happens all out, we, we don't see it. In the old days, you, everybody could see what happened on the farm, but it all happens beyond our ken most of the time. But the evidence is that when people on television are actually shown what a, a chicken factory is like, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, all these chickens all shoved together and, uh, you know, uh, pecking each other because they're so... Uh, they can't behave normally and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I mean, people see that, they're horrified by it. Um, yeah. People really don't want animals to be treated like that. Um, yeah. And um, I, I think it's, you know, the, the, the one of the, I was looking at the, 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 the government guidance that we have, we've had it for a long time in this country as a sort of thing that governs, uh, you know, when people are thinking about laws and, and stuff for animal welfare, I think sort of the five freedoms, and they include things like freedom from, hunger and thirst, freedom from injury and freedom from fear and distress and freedom to behave normally. You know, I think that's one of the things that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you say, I saw on, on television last night, there was this turkey factory and they're just all the just turkeys with no, no room to do more than stand where they are, you know, just herd. I mean, that, that's, not, that's not a normal life for an animal. And I, I think I think we ought to think about it again. Thinking of animals as subjects of their own lives, um, even if we're going to eat them, um, yes. it's only fair to them um, and, and only honouring to them as God's creatures. 
to... Uh, some, some, you're, I don't think you're a vegetarian and you wouldn't insist that vegetarianism is, as it were, the only option for Christians, obviously. So, uh, so no, 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 why no. not on that? And what would your attitude be now? Well, I do think, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't think Christians can think of vegetarianism as a sort of absolute requirement, if only because Jesus ate meat. Um, so it's not sort of absolutely wrong to eat meat. Um, I do think there are some good arguments around as to why um, not eating meat in our current situation, world situation, um, is a good idea. I've not been persuaded to do it by so what I have done uh, and what actually anybody can do quite easily is to cut down the amount of meat that we eat mm. it's very easy to do that um, yeah. and um, uh, this is partly the you know the, the environmental thing when you you start to realize you know how, how much cows contribute to the uh, I, I, I now drink only goat's milk not cow's milk which is better environmentally and just as nice actually no, no difference really um, so why not drink goat's milk those things we can do for our diet which actually are not, not particularly difficult at all um, yeah. Uh, which goes some way in that direction. Uh, what, and lastly, what about animal experimentation from medicine? Um, well, I would feel uneasy, but is it more a question of the way it's done than the, the very fact of it? I think, uh, I mean, one of the things about, about it is, is that I, I think that um, scientists got so used to using animals um, that they didn't really think, you know, do we actually need to use animals in this case or not? Uh, and I, I think the, the amount of animal exper experimentation has been decreasing because often you don't need to do it. Um, mm. uh, and there are also things about the, you know, the, the conditions in which you keep animals and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, I, I don't like the idea of it at all. I, it's, it becomes a difficult, I think, in an ethical sense, if it really is an issue of something that will save human lives, I think. But the, then you come back to, you know, one of those, those big ethical issues, like, you know, if it's a choice between a human life and an animal life, how do you choose? And, and, and if you do have to choose, I think one does have to choose a human life. Um, yeah. But uh, I think one ought to go a long way with before having to choose, if you can, if you can help it. I understand. Will that... Uh... We'll invite Nathan back in in a second, but while he's coming back, um, have you ever owned any pets? Um, on, only when I was a child, we had family pets. Um, I, you know, pets are so difficult if you go around and travel a lot and so on. That's the main reason I haven't, but... Um, but I do uh, know you hate snakes. Pets are, pets are a great idea. Pets are great, not snakes. No, no you don't like snakes. <laughs> I don't have a problem with snakes, but I, I, I I mean, we're, we're supposed to love. It's, it's like loving everybody. We can't possibly like everybody, can we? We love them. We don't, we don't actually have to like all of God's creatures, but we can love them. I just remember in our Bible study when the topic of snakes came up, uh, Richard, he just went sort of pale. It was a very distressing experience, clearly. Nathan, well, back, yeah, back no, to, sorry, it's a, back no, to no, you. No. All right. Well, Professor Begbie and Professor Bauckham, thank you so much for that very stimulating discussion. Um, and we do have a few minutes for Q&A now. And I'd again ask that the audience um, enter your questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, and while you're doing that, I have a few of my own here. Uh, Professor Begbie, I want to set your Christology in conversation with uh, Professor Bauckham's. Um, in some of your earlier work, you've written on the theology of creation and its relation to Christology. And one of the main uh, points of your Christology is the mediatorship of Christ. Mm. Um, now, mediatorship uh, tends to suggest a sort of superiority over creation um, and difference in relation to other creatures. Now, I believe that you locate this, uh, his status as mediator specifically in his humanity. And so I wonder if this implies that human beings have um, uh, a sort of status above other animals and in what sense that should be taken, um, and especially whether it leads to problematic ethical um, implications. Mm. Yeah, well, very large issues there. Yes, I do believe in the mediatorship of the, of the risen human Lord, um, because we can't, as it were, cut the humanity out of out of the risen Christ and only speak about the, the Lordship of the Son of God. Um, and that does indeed imply 
a particular a particular status for humans over animals. I don't think we can get away from that. But that's a very different thing from denigrating animals or suggesting that they are only there for humans and not in their own right as able to glorify God through Christ. So, I, th I mean, that's, as it were, that's the big picture. So that could indeed, as you rightly say, that could that could give a very twisted idea of lordship if you weren't careful. But I'm picking what Richard's saying. If 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 Christ is the one who's identified, yes, with human creatures, of course he's risen as human, but in that flesh is, so to speak, um, representatively, the flesh of all creatures. Then it looks it looks a very different kind of picture. It does. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, and while we're talking about your views in particular, uh, could you say a little bit about the relation of the arts um, to the theology of creation and specifically to animals? This is, I mean, this is a very large topic and maybe it would take us too far afield, but if you have any um, shorter comments on that. Well, the kind of models I, uh, I've often used of, of the art would be a, a, slight, a slight variation on, on rich. I, I, I'm okay with the language of um, priesthood and so forth. I can see the great danger of that as everything seems to be funneled through humans. I'm, but I do want to say that the, what the arts are doing at their very best is, is we're taking pieces of creation, patterns, relations, physical things or whatever, and forming them in a way that praises God and gives glory to God. And indeed bring, uh, the arts bring new kinds of order as well as even perhaps redeem this order uh, and in that, they are mirroring, certainly, and perhaps even participating at their best in what Christ has done and is doing. That will be my kind of model on that. Now, how that relates specifically to non-human animals, I'd need to work pretty hard on that. I've not done much work on that, honestly. Um, and I probably ought to. That's a bit of a gap. I take the challenge. Okay. Yeah, well, look forward to seeing what you do with that. Um, Professor Bauckham, could you say a little bit about sacrifice in the Old Testament in particular? I mean, it looks as though there are, you know, I mean, when we see factory farming, the statistics today, there's just vast numbers, but then there also seems to be, I mean, it's not really comparable to what we see today, but nonetheless, very large numbers of animals killed um, for no other reason than sacrifice. Um, do you have a reading of this that can help us through it? Yes, and I think uh, we do have to sort of face up to that because, you know, we, we tend to think of the temple as rather like a, you know, a big church with, with lovely music and stuff. But the temple was actually full of blood and animal noise and uh, being slaughtered and all sorts of things. It was in some ways a part of the temple was a bit more like an abattoir. Um, uh, well, one of the things you always have to say about these uh, elements in the Law of Moses is that um, everybody in the ancient world sacrificed to their gods. It was the accepted form of worship. And it's rather like slavery. I think what God does in the Law of Moses is to take these common institutions um, and, and, and to mold them uh, in, in a certain way so that you know, slavery, it's not really very much like slavery once the Law of Moses has dealt with it. Um, sacrifice, uh, I mean, one way of looking at it in a way is that, is that it's actually a, a, an honouring of, of the animals, that they are fit mm. to be um, given to the praise of God. Um, and so it's, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it's not actually, I mean, it, it's, it's certainly not denigrating animals, it's actually um, elevating them in, 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 in value. Um, but of course, it was always meant to be temporary, um, uh, you know, pending the, the coming of Christ. Yes, that's very helpful. very helpful. Now, I have a question here from uh, Professor Daniel Stulock. He is here, and let's see here. I'm just going to read the question. It's a bit long, so stick with me. Uh, how does Dr. Bauckham's concept of responsible care from Genesis 1 include the intrinsically violent concept of subduing, which comes from the Hebrew root kibosh, and which is closely related to the slaughter of sacrificial animals. It seems to me that if we do not account for the violence that is basic to this term, then we'll be left with the romantic notion of dominion that cannot account for the way in which the Bible identifies humans as God-created eaters. 
how does one uh, kill, masticate, and digest a carrot or a mushroom or a sheep while exercising care? If we don't include the language of use in our notion of dominion, then we're likely to perpetuate the division between spheres of protection and spheres of preservation that contemporary agrarians such as Wendell Berry and Wes Jackson have called a form of schizophrenia. Could Dr. Bauckham respond? Well, uh, first of all, I think we've got to actually distinguish between three things. The dominion is um, over all other living creatures. In addition, we're told to subdue the earth, the earth, not animals, the earth. We're told to subdue the earth and multiply. And I think the um, analogies to that use of the verb from the other parts of the Old Testament is, is when um, a, a king, for example, takes possession of a territory. So it's about taking possession of the soil and farming it, which was a very hard job, you know, as Adam found out later on. Um, so, so subduing the earth is about um, making use of the earth um, so that we can multiply and fill the earth. It's, and it's actually, it's much the same as the fish are told to multiply and fill the sea, you know. So this isn't something specially human that derives from our being in the image of God. It, it, it's just part of the way in which, and all creatures, of course, uh, have the, the right and the necessity to use other creatures for their own life and flourishing, you know. Um, and humans do as well, but that's not the dominion. That's just a very ordinary thing. That's just how we how we survive and, and live and so on. You know, the dominion is something else, and um, and the subduing the, of the earth is part of uh, the um, uh, you know making a living out of out of the soil really, which is what basically we have to do. And it's what you know it, it was farming, of course, that enabled humans to spread all over the world. Um, it's a fairly distinctive human thing. Um, so I, I think these are quite different. And, the, you know, the intriguing thing about uh, Genesis is, is that all the animals, including us, are vegetarian. In Genesis 1, um, God gives us all green things. Uh, and he says, you know, he says to us, and I've also given all these green things to, to other animals, other the land animals, um, to, to eat. And it's only after the flood that there's permission to eat. And, and, and violence comes in, uh, and that's where you get, you know, a, a recognition of, of the violent relationships in certain ways, because, you know, animals can be dangerous to us, we can be dangerous to animals, um, and, and the post-flood provisions do take account of that, and, and they, they include eating meat, but um, it, it's as though eating meat is actually a, a kind of a second best. Um, that's only a kind of concession. And the other interesting thing I think is really interesting is the, the rules uh, to Israel that they must not eat the blood. They must always uh, drain the blood out of meat before they eat it. And the, the blood is kind of symbolizes the life, the God-given life of that creature. So not eating the blood is kind of a way of respecting that life. Um, it, it's not just anything, you know, it, it means something you, you, to, to take life, even uh, even if it's um, uh, an animal, um, there's life there to be respected. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's what I'd say. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that uh, eating meat was sort of a second best um, in terms of Genesis. Now, if Jesus is risen from the dead and the new age has in some sense already been inaugurated and Christians are called to leave the old order of things behind, and to live into the new reality inaugurated by Jesus. Now, does this uh, provide any further reason for giving up meat and animal products in general? <laughs> well, Jesus, after the resurrection, does eat fish, if you remember. Um, yeah. And I, I think, uh, I mean, I think the resurrection stories, of course, are necessarily about the risen Jesus participating in our world as it is now, you know, so it's not a picture of you know, the, the paradise to come when the whole creation is renewed. Um, but I think, I think 11, Isaiah 11, you know, uh, uh, of, the, of the animals living, and uh, what you have to recognize about Isaiah 11 is that 
as things stand, it's biologically impossible. In other words, a, a, a lion simply cannot be vegetarian. It, it's made. It's, and a lion that was vegetarian would actually be a different species because it's so intrinsic to how a lion is made. Bears are a bit different. They, they could be vegetarian, actually. Um, but um, so, so it's, it's a kind of an ideal. Um, but I think it does point towards that the idea of it is to point towards um, the new creation um, of, of peace um, uh, among all of God's creatures. Um, and, you know, we can't, we can't envisage that. I mean, we don't know how literally lions and lambs will lie down together. What, what does that mean? What will that translate into in the, in the new creation? But it gives us a vision, which I think is looking back to, to Eden and the beginning of things, as I was taking that picture and, and, and uh, throwing it into the future as, as, as what we can, we can hope for. And it, it's, it's symbolic, but that doesn't mean it doesn't say anything important. True, yeah. We have a question here from Sydney Williams. Uh, what are your thoughts on zoos, and especially those that are not merely for rehabilitation? Um, the, the, I mean, yes, the, the useful things that zoos do is, uh, not quite sure what you mean by rehabilitation, but, but sort of conserving species and, and breeding species in captivity so that they can be released again into the wild. I think in the world as it is, that's actually a very important function that, that zoos have. Um, I, I, th I think a lot, I mean, I, I don't know, I haven't visited huge numbers of zoos. I think zoos are catching on to the need to, I mean, to take that phrase again from the, from the five freedoms I use, you know, to animals should be able to behave normally. I mean, that's about domestic animals, but, you know, wild animals must, but to justify keeping them uh, in captivity, well, they, they must be given, you know, and those, those awful cages that they used to keep lions and tigers in where the, you know they just prowl up and down and, and they, they, they it actually does them does their minds in you know i mean the, the captive animals like that um but can i come in can i come in there what do you see as, as the good of, of a zoo of a zoological garden well, i mean it used it, the good that it used to do of course was just to familiarize people with all these animals that they would never otherwise see um and i i think that that was good if the animals were treated well uh, I mean, of course, that's so much less necessary now because we have, you know, people like David Attenborough, we have just wonderful, uh, uh, and actually we can learn far more about animals by seeing them in their wild state on film than, than we can in zoos. So, uh, I mean, there is the thing, you know, you know children, um, there are <laughs> children are allowed to handle snakes, you know, in zoos. <laughs> Horrible, horrible. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, they're allowed to feed animals and so on. I mean, for, for children, it's kind of familiarising them with with wild animals, not just domestic ones. I mean, I think a sort of scaled down zoo that was clear about its purpose, conservation, and uh, and perhaps way, ways in which a zoo might, you know, help us to relate to animals better um, and do something that, uh, films and so on, uh, documentaries can't do. Um, but I, I haven't thought that through very, very well. I think that's sort of direction in which one ought to think. Yeah. Okay, we have one from Alice Grant. How would you respond to a child who asks you if her dog died this year, if her dog who died this year will go to heaven and why will she see her dog in heaven? <laughs> I have no doubt about saying yes, because I think that the new creation is God's taking of the whole of his creation, Every, everything that's good in creation, everything that God values in creation. And I mean creation over time. You know, the new creation is not just what happens to this creation as it will be at the end of everything. It's what happens to the whole creation. And in human terms, that means the resurrection of the dead. Um, but I think it means the, uh, the, the, uh, and it's impossible to think of this literally, how it would happen. But I think that's really what the new creation is about. It's about conserving, about God conserving into his own eternity, the whole of his creation, beginning to end. Um, uh, of course, purged of suffering and, and evil. Um, but everything God values in his, in his creation, I'm sure God values that little girl's dog. So I have no doubt about saying yes to that. Could I just um, 
Could I, may I just add to that? Hello, Alice. Good, good to hear from you. Um, uh, this is maybe slightly speculative, but but along with everything that God values, presumably are the relationships between things. And if I mean, I'm thinking of elderly people I know from, from very special relationship with with a, indeed a dog or cat or whatever, or indeed some very unusual pets sometimes, that so to speak has become part of who they are. It's become part of their very being. And the idea that that is just going to, as it were, to be to be peeled away. Uh, seems no doesn't seem to make any sense at all um so again i would uh i'd have no hesitation about saying yeah now one of the rationales for resurrection in the old testament in the first place is partly um that it's god's answering to suffering and death um it's the all of the suffering and death can in part be understood um, because god is going to make everything new and resurrect human beings now if that's part of the rationale for resurrection, then presumably you could apply this to animals as well. Um, it's hard to see why God would see human suffering as um, reason for uh, resurrection and not the suffering that's um, as great and on a far greater scale in most cases, in the case of animals. How would you respond to that, Professor Bauckham or Professor Begbie? Do you want to turn, Jeremy? <laughs> no, no, I'm just going to you carry on, Richard. You're doing great. I just need a, a few minutes to think on it. Right. Um, yes, I, I mean, there is, I, I think it's true to say that, that there's something, it, it depends on the degree of consciousness, I guess, the extent to which, uh, you know, being freed from suffering will, will, will kind of make a difference consciously to, to, to a creature. Um, so maybe one shouldn't put it all on the same level of theodicy, but but I mean it's certainly true that you know one of the in a way one of the biggest problems of, of the, the problem of suffering is you know a lot of human suffering we're responsible for ourselves you know and of course there's natural disasters and stuff, but the the animal world is just rife with suffering and it seems to be kind of part and parcel of of of, of much. Uh, animal life and it's that that um, suffering within the animal world that um, uh, you know we, we, we do feel if we think about it that um, God ought to do something about that yes yeah. that was um, of course one of the things that worried Darwin most of all mm -hmm. he had I gather there was quite a fixation on a particular was it a wasp or something but the way they treated each other was just horrendous um, and he thought of the, he thought of this yeah sorry he thought of the scale on which this was happening you know something was we must come to terms with in some way sorry you were saying? Well, i think i think we, we must be careful not to anthropomorphize too much so yeah. you know yeah. insects do horrible things to each other but insects yeah. don't feel pain insects don't feel pain so you know we, we do have to remember those kind of things um uh you know uh, and in a way that the, the, the horribleness of things insects do is a kind of a more aesthetic reaction on our part i think than a, than yeah an i think he took it I, I think he was taking it as symbolic of something much wider yeah yeah yeah, 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 no, yeah, so. yeah indeed and there is something wider i agree yeah. amy peterson asks whether other non-animal created beings are able to step outside of their limited context to see the reality of environmental degradation that we've created um, she asked specifically about the implications of recent research about the ways that trees communicate with each other through roots, fungi, and other methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just incredibly interesting, isn't it, about trees. I love trees. Um, and, you know, one, one of the things that um, seems to me to, to happen, the, the more we know about other creatures, the more remarkable they are. And, and, and the more things that we used to think were purely human, actually have analogies of some kind in, in other creatures. So uh, as you say that trees trees uh, communicate and, and they kind of look, look out for each other, you know? They warn each other when something's coming, uh, like some nasty disease or something. Um, it, it's remarkable and we, we, we never thought that about trees before. Um, That's why, it's another, quite, sorry, Karen. 
you know, I was going to say the other great thing about trees that, that of course people didn't used to know at all is, is how essential they are to the, the earth's climate. You know, I mean, it, it, planting trees is, is one of the ways out of climate change uh, disaster. Um, and, uh, you, you know, we just can realize how, how, how you know, trees are absolutely necessary in our world. Uh, and and we, we should be thinking of trees, you know, as, as, as prime fellow creatures that, that we ought to be thankful to uh, and, and care about. Yes. Wendy asks whether there is a truly humane way to end the life of an animal for human consumption. I, I, mean, I, I don't think I'm expert enough to know the answer to that, to be honest. Yeah, I understand. I, I, would, I would think there is. Um, I mean, don't, don't, they, um, don't they stun animals out, you know, so they're, they're not conscious when they, I don't know, I don't quite know. What it, I mean, you get, you get, it, it comes into the news, doesn't it, when there's some controversy about uh, Jewish and, and Muslim um, uh, killing of animals. How, 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 do you, um, how do you kill the animal in the, in the right kosher sort of way? Um, but I, I gather that what Jews now do is to stun the animal so that when you cut the throat, the animal is no longer conscious. Yes. But as a general question, I, I don't really think I can uh, talk about it. Thank you very much. Charlotte Trombin, I think, I hope I'm getting that right, asks um, about specifically Jesus's eating of fish. And she asks, in our contemporary context, I mean, perhaps it, it was necessary for whatever reason to eat fish just in order to survive. Um, in some contexts. And she asks now in our current world, especially in um, wealthier parts where eating vegetarian is certainly an option, whether it's still justifiable. Um, so I guess you could reframe it as, um, I mean, especially for Christians, to the extent that we are able to live into this reality that Jesus has inaugurated in which death is not the defining factor in Christian ethics, um, to the extent that it's possible, is that something that Christians are um, or, or should think seriously about. Uh, think seriously about being vegetarian. Is yeah. that the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah absolutely. No, I, 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 as I said before, I think, I think the arguments are, uh, and uh, the argument from our contemporary context, I think is a good deal stronger than historically arguments for vegetarianism or indeed for veganism have been. Um, because of the environmental impact and the fact that you know um, we've we've overfished the oceans disastrously, um, whereas you know in the past we didn't have that sort of impact in the past. You know people people might overfish a small area, but it quickly recovered. Um, these kind of global things that that we're now faced with, I I, I do think it greatly strengthens the case of vegetarianism. Um, and I, I think I, I was, I was, I was merely saying. I, I mean, it's, it's rather like energy use and all kinds of things. I, I'm not quite sure that we can lay down the law for everybody. I mean, people need to face up to these things, these changes in lifestyle uh, that are needed. But we've got to kind of think about it for ourselves and do it in our own way. But I'm not meaning at all to detract from the strength of the argument. Uh, and as I said before, I think the least that we can mostly do in the West um, is, is to cut down on our meat consumption. And I, another thing about ancient Palestine, you see, is that meat was usually a luxury. Um, Jesus probably didn't eat all that much meat. He probably ate a lot of fish because he lived near the Sea of Galilee. And people near the Sea of Galilee lived on fish and, and bread, basically. Um, but uh, people didn't eat meat very much. Um, and um, um, yeah, so I mean, it's the modern West, just because we're affluent, you know, we, we've become greedy about meat, I think. I think the thing that's t taken me close, closest to vegetarian, I've never been a vegetarian, but closest to it is, is suggested by the question there in the, um, at least in my case, it's, it's when I've seen the amount of meat that is consumed and thrown away. Um, and th those quantities are simply astronomical. <laughs> yeah. 
and way beyond any kind of necessity for survival or anything else. Now, particularly, dare I say, in the US and UK and Europe more widely. And that, that really does need addressing, it seems to me. So that's a very strong argument for vegetarianism. Yeah, certainly. We have a question here. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Of course. OK. We have one from Sarah Bonner. And oops, the lights just turned off, but I'll get those in a second. Uh, she's wondering about what we can learn, especially from the views of indigenous peoples and how those can inform Christian approaches to animal ethics. Um, it's a good question. I, I don't think I've really got much to say, except that of course indigenous people did and do tend to live in a, in a sustainable way. Um, I mean, not not universally, um, but um, many many of them do. Um, yes. uh, animal animal it's not, that's not exactly animal ethics. Um, I never know. Is it is it true that um, Native Americans used to apologise to animals before they ate them, apologise to the meat before eating them? I, I I I've heard that. I never really know if it's if it's actually true, but it's, it, it's nice because it's a bit like what I was saying about not eating blood in, in the Old Testament. You know, uh, if you do eat um, animals, uh, living beings, then you should at least respect them and realize what you're doing and not, not, not take it as a matter of course, you know? Yes, absolutely. We have a question here on Acts 10. Um, and Peter's vision where God says, kill and eat. Um, what are we supposed to make of this? Does it uh, suggest a lack of concern on God's part for animal life? And I'll be right back. I'm just going to fix these lights. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, it's got nothing to do with diet. It, it's, a, it's a parable about Jews and Gentiles. So the unclean animals represent the Gentiles. Um, and Peter is being asked to kill and eat unclean animals, which as a Jew he would not normally do. Um, but he's not literally being asked, asking, he's not literally being given a lesson that all animals are clean. He's, he's being told that it's okay, uh, because the, the, one of the things in, in, the, in the Mosaic Law again was the division between clean and unclean animals was to teach Jews about the division between the people of God and, and the idolatrous pagans. Um, but um, Peter is being taught that he doesn't need that distinction anymore. And, and he can go and visit Cornelius without any problem. So it's nothing about diet, actually. I think people often misunderstand that story. It's, 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 not, it's nothing to do with diet or, 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 or killing or anything, really. It's a parable. That's very you look exactly the same, Nathan. We can see you very well. Don't worry about <laughs> it. OK, yeah, the lights are not coming back on, but I'm glad you can see. You're fine. It's fine. Oh, we do have a question also about uh, evolution. And I mean, the picture that evolutionary biology often gives us is one that is, I mean, hardly compatible with the peaceable kingdom ideal that uh, Christianity at least hopes for. Um, so how do we reckon, I mean, is Christianity sort of a, against nature in that sense? Um, obviously the, uh, you know, the eschaton is not going to be simply what we see now, but is it going to be just completely the opposite of uh, what evolutionary biology seems to suggest? Uh, I mean, one thing about evolutionary biology that I gather people are saying rather strongly nowadays is that it, it, evolution doesn't only work by competition, it works just as much by collaboration. Um, and species don't, don't only compete, they, they also collaborate. So there's, there's two sides to how, um, how evolution uh, works. Yeah, um, I mean, going, going just on that very thing, Sarah Coakley's Gifford lectures mm -hmm. addressed this very question. She worked closely with, um, I believe, as a biologist or evolutionist in Harvard, um, and develops that argument really quite consistently in a kind of natural theology direction. That that would be worth worth looking up on that. Yes. Sorry, yes. Richard. I mean, the other thing is just in terms of kind of eschatology, but. The point of eschatology, you know, sometimes we think the point of eschatology is just for God to repair what's gone wrong. Um, but it's actually just as much for God to, to perfect 
a world that is not yet perfect. So there's there's redemption and there's also fulfillment. Um, and, and, and the obvious example of that, of course, is that death will be abolished. Um, and death, death is kind of natural in, 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 in this world, but it's also kind of regrettable. Um, so we can think of those things, I think, as, as, as kind, of, uh, kind of on the, the creation on its way to being something better. Now, Nathan, in the patristic material, you must have found a lot on that, presumably. Yes. Oh, there's, I mean, there is a fair bit on the, I mean, on animals, it's actually quite interesting because, I mean, most people would expect that the, you know, the patristic writers would be sort of the last place to look for resources and helping with animals. But there are actually a vast number of patristic authors who were vegetarians themselves. And of mm. course, they were vegetarians for um, ascetical reasons. But nonetheless, it's an interesting question whether their asceticism can sort of be resourced for contemporary theology in precisely this yep. direction because so many arguments for animal welfare are um, problematic in various ways, especially when they are utilitarian or um, going down a Kantian route. So anyway, yes, the patristic resources are definitely interesting. I do have one final question, if we have time for that. It's a narrative that some people have been troubled by, which is um, the incident in which God sort of, or sorry, when Jesus casts the herd or the, yeah, oh, yeah. the demon yeah. to the herd of pigs, runs them off a cliff into the lake. What do we make of that? Does he value pigs less than demons? <laughs> um, I, I, think he, I think he values pigs less than humans, which doesn't mean he doesn't value pigs. But I see it as, as a thing about the lesser evil because what do de uh, and remember the demons asked to go into the pigs, so he's he's allowing them to do what they're wanting to do. Um, but what do demons do uh, if they don't go into pigs? They 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 go to some other human, or or they or they come back. I mean, there's a story in the Bible in the New Testament, isn't there, about demons when they've been cast out, and then they get seven other demons worse than themselves, and they come back um, and uh, possess the the original person. So. It's as it were, sending the demons somewhere that's not as bad as destroying human life. Yes, certainly. Well, Professor Begbin, Professor Bauckham, we are so grateful for your time, and you've taken a lot more than we had originally discussed, which we are just so grateful for. Um, and we want to again express the gratitude of Duke and Creature Kind to both of you, and for the audience. I hope that, uh, or I want to invite you also to attend future sessions in this series, which will include upcoming conversations between Ellen Davis and Sam Wells, and another between David Goatley and Peter Cazzarella. And professors, thank you again for your time. And to everyone in the audience, thank you very much for taking some time out of your day to participate in this event. Have a wonderful day.